Good morning, BookTube. Bill Rutenberg here with the Rutenberg Library. Uh, I wanted to come to you today with a book chat. This is a, a discussion that a whole lot of you out, out there have asked me to do, and you were curious about my thoughts on the book Grant by Ron Chernow. Now, uh, this book, very good book in my opinion. I buddy read this with Brian over over at his channel. Uh, brand new channel, by the way. My friend Brian, He, uh, I'll leave a link to that down below in the description. He did the BookTube newbie tag last night, so I'd you know, I would recommend you guys, suggest you guys all go, all go and uh, watch his video, give him a like, like subscribe, and uh, we'll get him going. He's He's been a commenter on many of your channels and my channel for, uh, been a subscriber of mine for, uh, you know, quite a while, and very witty guy. But anyway, we, uh, he, he has a ton of insight, by the way. You're going to love getting to know him. So, um, in my process of getting to know him, I've uh, done this buddy read, and uh, we did this over the last couple of months. I think we really got into it in June and July is where, where we really uh, got this book read, and I finished it up in the first week. We finished up about the same time uh, after that first week of August. Um, it is a big book. It is 1,074 pages total. It's got 959 pages of text, and then the rest of it is... Uh, his source notes and the index, but <clears throat> uh, it took us a while to get through it, but it's probably good. This is not a book that you probably want to speed read, um, but anyway, 1,074 pages from Ron Chernow from Penguin Press. It's a 2017 book. Uh, highly recommend it. Ron Chernow, as you well know, uh, writes these chunky monkeys for biographies, these cradle to grave, as he calls them, uh, biographies. He's uh, wrote two other ones that were pretty famous that a lot of you have read, uh, the one on Washington, A Life, and then the other one on Alexander Hamilton, which the famous play that's out, or it's been out for a few years now, uh, Hamilton, it's all, you know, it's based on his his book, or uh, they, they, you know, they corresponded back and forth. But uh, he's also got four other major works uh, that maybe are a little lesser known just because they're earlier. Uh, I think his Hamilton and Washington are the ones that put him on the map, and then this is just kind of running with that. But he did uh, another one on J.P. Morgan. He did another one on John D. Rockefeller, the Warburgs, and I want to say the, like the banking industry. And so um, big books, but he is a very good writer. It's uh, his work is usually fairly fast paced, um, not speedy, but at a good, you know, a good clip. So um, this book is broken into four parts. The first part is going to cover his um, his youth, going through West Point all the way up to, um, I think it stops at right after the Mexican War, and it, and it goes through some of the struggles, and it goes through the struggles of when he got done with the Mexican War, uh, you know, and all the jobs that he went through. So part two deals with the Civil War and his role in the Civil War. Part three is uh, his two terms as president, and then part four is his post-presidency to his death. So he's got this broken up into, you know, part one's like 100 pages or so, Part two or part four on the other end of it is, you know, short, short part, 100, 150 pages, whatever it is. And then the middle two are the huge parts, the Civil War and the uh, two terms as president. But um, this was, a, like I said, a very good book, Cradle to Grave. It hits all of the details. If you want to know about uh, uh, Ulysses Grant, read this book. I gave it um, a four and a half out of five stars would probably be uh, my grade on it, or not grade, but my rating on it. Um, he did have some huge um, themes that run through this book, uh, one of which uh, runs, the, one of the themes that runs through it is something that really hadn't been done by other authors, according to him. I was watching an interview with him, and he was talking about stuff that, you know, he tried to really you know, certain points that he tried to drive through the whole book. And one of them that he said, uh, one theme that he said that he hadn't seen done, it's mentioned, but it's not done as a, from, you know, beginning to end and how it affected his life all the way through. And that was, uh, that one theme was alcoholism, uh, the life of an alcoholic. And, and uh, Chernow feels that Grant was truly 
uh, an example of an alcoholic and a man who battled, you know, drinking all of his life. And he had some times when he was very successful. And then there were some times when he wasn't successful. And he, you know, he fully discusses this. Um, I know Brian and I throughout our, vo or not our Vox, our email chats, you know, we talked about that, that, that was definitely, and that was before I watched that video by the author. Um, I mean, you pick up on it pretty quick that the theme of uh, the life of an alcoholic runs through the whole thing. There, I don't know that there is a single chapter in here where it doesn't talk about his alcoholism and how that related to his life. And and I'm talking, you know, when he actually was, you know, falling down drunk to when he was able to turn his glass upside down on the on the table and say, I don't want any thing to drink, you know, from, from the bad to the good. And then the rumors that went with it and how that affected his life, that, that theme runs through the whole, whole book. And I thought that was fascinating. Um, there were times where I'm like, okay, I'm tired of reading about alcohol. Um, I, I will admit that I was, uh, I, I did get to that point, but to the author's credit, uh, you, you know, if you suffer from that, that's definitely going to have a, uh, an effect on your life and it'll unfortunately it can run your life if you if you let it and so that was just something that grant dealt with throughout his entire life and i felt that cherno was extremely sympathetic to the issue um i thought i thought he handled the issue very very well he didn't um necessarily beat grant over the head with it he he was sympathetic and um just found ways that to explain how this affected his life. Another theme that runs through this is um, that that I found was Grant's uh, marriage, his his loving marriage, and how his wife Julia was such a stable. Um, oh, you know, she was a cornerstone for him. Uh, he relied on her, whether that was. Whether that was, uh, you know, just in, you know, your basic, you know, forming your family or keeping you steady and being a rock for you when you have those issues of alcoholism, you know, keeping you sober. And then, you know, somebody who is your, uh, not only your helpmate, your, your loving helpmate and your helpmate in that alcohol issue, but also uh, a political helpmate and and Julia was his biggest fan and and it was pretty interesting because they come from polar opposite families as we see in the book where uh, Grant's family was abolitionists they did not believe in slavery at all and Julia's family they were they had a plantation they owned slaves and just the the um, issues that we see there and how they are able to blend together and see changes in both individuals to make their loving marriage work. That was, um, I thought, I found that to be heartwarming. I thought that was a, a great look at a, at a, you know, a good marriage. And, um, so another thing that's looked at throughout the book and would probably be an obvious theme is just Grant's character. Uh, just what kind of man is Grant? And, uh, you know, we, some of the things he points out in the book is how humble Grant is, you know, from, from his humble beginnings to just the idea that, um, you know, he's, he's not a self promoter. Uh, you know, he's, he's going to put himself in a position to be successful, but he's not going to be a braggart. And uh, we see that throughout the whole book and where he's, you know, he's given a job, he does the job, he doesn't seek glory. And I found that to be a very good, you know, quality in a person. Uh, he is a loyal guy. He is a, a loyal Republican. He's, he's loyal to his friends. Now, that can be good and bad, as we see in, in his military life, his loyalty to his fellow um, soldiers and his, his military family. That loyalty, you know, wins him respect. It gains him uh, a lot of uh, trust with his men, enabling him to do things that other officers maybe couldn't get their men to do, where they trust Grant. So like his loyalty to William Sherman or his loyalty to uh, Phil Sheridan. 
you know, definitely some loyalties built up there and his, his loyalty, um, to, uh, oh, good night. I'm going to go blank on his name. Um, I'll come to it in a minute, but, uh, you know, just loyalty to his men around him. And it was an absolute wonderful quality where you've got other officers who are not, you know, as loyal. Um, he's empathetic or sympathetic to those around him. And that plays big. He is an honorable man. You know, he is, he is very, and one that I didn't write down that I should have is he is, uh, very, you know, he's, he's honorable, but he's also trustworthy. Now, the problem is because of his loyalty and his, you know, and, and being a trustworthy guy, people take advantage of him. And, you know, so these qualities that are great in a man can also play out to be not so great. Uh, John Rollins is the other guy that he's very, very loyal to that's in his military family. Sorry about that. But um, anyway, th these themes run throughout the book. And I think Ron Cherneau did a wonderful job of, of taking, you know, alcoholism and showing how it tied his life together, that loving marriage, the uh, Grant's character and how his characteristics, you know, were a driving force in his success as a man. But uh, before I get to talking about some of the stuff that gets covered in this book, because I'll, I'll be honest, a lot of this stuff you're going to be familiar with, but uh, those were some of the things, you know, themes I wanted to discuss. And then there's also a quote in here that I found to be kind of a, it's in the introduction, it's a driving force for the whole book. And I wanted to uh, read this with, uh, read this to you. So if you'll bear with me here. So this is, this is from in the introduction and it's on page Roman numeral 21. And it says, the caricature of Grant as a filthy butcher is ironic for a man who couldn't stomach the sight of blood studiously refrained from romanticizing warfare and shied away from a military career. I never went into battle willingly or with enthusiasm, he remarked. I was always glad when a battle was over. Invariably, it dep de deprecated war. He deprecated war. It is, all, it is at all times a sad and cruel business. I hate war with all my heart, and nothing but imperative duty could induce me to engage in its work or witness its horrors. Grant never grew vainglorious for military fame, never gloated over enemy defeats, never engaged in victory celebrations. He has been derided as a plodding, dim-witted commander who enjoyed superior manpower and material and whose crude idea of strategy was to launch large, brutal assaults upon the enemy. In fact, close students of the war have shown that the percentages of casualties in Grant's armies was often lower than those of many Confederate generals. If Grant never shrank from sending masses of soldiers into bloody battles, it had nothing to do with the heartless disregard for human life and everything to do with bringing the war to a speedy conclusion. And as he points out in the book, there's several times where Grant's found, you know, when the battle's over and, and things are sinking in, he's found crying on the side, crying for the individuals that were in the battle. He had a way of during the battle, like in the middle of the battle, kind of shutting off that side of his brain and, you know, doing what needed to get done in the battle, sending his troops where they needed to go. He might see a lot of bloodshed, but he gets the job done. And then afterwards, there's that soft side of him. And, and Chernow does a good job throughout the book, in, or throughout at least that Civil War uh, part of the book, of showing this. So let me read one more paragraph to you, because I think it's, it's kind of important to the whole book here. Uh, so the relentless focus on Grant's last battles against Robert E. Lee in Virginia has obscured his stellar record of winning battles in the Western War long before taking charge of Union forces in early 1864. After that, he did not simply direct the Army of the Potomac, but masterminded the coordinated movements of all federal forces. A far-seeing general, he adopted a comprehensive policy for all theaters of war, treating them as an interrelated whole. However brilliant Lee was as a tactician, Grant surpassed him in grand strategy, crafting the plan that defeated the Confederacy. The military historian John Keegan paid homage 
to Grant as the towering military genius of the Civil War and noted the modern modernity of his methods as he mobilized railroads and telegraphs to set his armies in motion. Grant, he concluded, was the greatest general of the war, one who would have excelled at any time in any army. And so I thought that was pretty powerful because it does set the, the stage for basically the rest of um, Ron Trineau's thoughts about Grant. It really, it really uh, sets the stage. And so this book is all about um, basically, obviously Grant, but I mean, it's all about taking away that idea that he was just a butcher. He wasn't just a butcher. He was a great military guy who sometimes gets overshadowed by Robert E. Lee, and he shouldn't. He defeated Robert E. Lee, and he needs that credit. And um, I think he does a really good job in part two, where he looks at the Civil War. Ron Chernow does a very good job of that in this book. Um, so, like I said, throughout the book, it's going to take you, you know, historically it hits every major marker. Um, I was trying to, I was trying to think of, you know, was there anything that got skipped? And I cannot see anything that got skipped. I will admit this is my first major biography of Ulysses Grant that I've read. I've obviously read about him. I've, I've read tons of Civil War books and, you know, there's chapters and half a book, de you know, dedicated to him, but not a whole, I've never read a whole biography. I have some over here on the shelf, just hadn't got to them, and I made it a point this summer of getting to them. And this was, I think, a wonderful book to start with. <coughs> uh, so, you know, in his in his youth, we really set the stage in part one with uh, Grant's issues with um, alcoholism after he graduates from West Point, fights in the Mexican War, and gets sent to the Pacific Coast and really starts to get hammered with loneliness, not being near his wife, not being able to see his children when they're babies. All of that sets in, the depression sets in, and I mean, it just sets the stage for a bad deal. And Grant begins drinking. I mean, there's no no way of getting around that. And he ends up leaving the military. Um, you can argue about, you know, did he get kicked out or did he, you know, he, he signed a resignation, but was it a forced resignation? You know, there's, there's different arguments for that. Any way around it, he quit the army uh, because of, a large part because of those drinking issues. And he wanted to be around his family. And to me, you can't blame a guy for that. But, uh, Chernow is going to take us through those struggles afterwards where, you know, he was a successful military guy. He was really good in war. But when he got into civilian life, he was not so good. He was failed at several different jobs in his youth as he covers in part one. So when we come to the part of, oh yeah, and then we find him almost groveling at the feet of his parents and his in-laws, you know, trying to get a job so that he can provide for his family. You know, he wants to provide. It's just he's not good at anything. Or I don't even want to say he's not good. He just has a lot of bad luck. The timing of everything is not good. And so um, anyway, when the Civil War hits, this is his opportunity. And Grant jumped on that opportunity and, and went you know, full speed ahead. And he had many obstacles in the way where he could have quit. He wanted to quit in some cases. Sherman keeps him, uh, you know, keeps him active in the war. He butted heads with Henry Halleck quite a bit, uh, amongst other people. And uh, he's, he's going to find success. And obviously, Lincoln's going to see that success. You know, I can't get rid of him. He fights. You know, he sees that success. And he's going to bring him from the Western Theater to the Eastern Theater because out in the Eastern Theater uh, along the coast, uh, Lincoln had been going through, I'm telling you, he'd been going through generals left and right. And he needed somebody who was going to be stable, who was going to stay and fight, was going to be, you know, that that solid footing for his soldiers to stand on. And that's that's going to be uh, Grant. He's going to take, take over uh the overall command, not only of just the army, but all of the army. And so at that point, you know, he leaves Sherman in charge of the West. He's in charge in the East. And together they make an awesome team. And he's going to, you know, defeat in various ways without going into all the details and making this video two hours long. Um, 
he is going to defeat Robert E. Lee. And um, obviously this success is going to bring him notoriety and uh, his political success will all come from his military success. If, they, if he can lead a man, man in battle, he can lead men in Washington. And, um, you know, so slowly after the war, his, his uh, political success will begin to rise. Lincoln will be obviously assassinated at the end of the war. Johnson comes in, he butts heads with Andrew Johnson and um, eventually becomes Johnson's successor. And he will serve for two, uh, in part three, they'll cover the, the two terms. <coughs> Excuse me. He will serve two terms in the presidency and um, he will be a huge advocate for civil rights. Uh, Reconstruction, the radical side of Reconstruction, uh, would not have been able to happen without Grant, I don't think, as successfully as it did. And obviously there was a lot of, I say successfully, maybe that's not the right word, the, the advances that uh, these former slaves, the African Americans who were in slavery, who have now found freedom, the successes that they had, the, you know, their freedom in general, the, the citizenship, and then the right to vote, Grant made sure that that happened. Now, obviously, Reconstruction, you know, in the end, things kind of fell apart and we had Jim Crow laws and, you know, a lot of stuff went backwards. But the advances that they had were in large part because of Grant. And um, as Ron Cherneau points out, you know, Frederick Douglass was one of his biggest fans. And Douglass really realized how important Grant was to civil rights. And, uh, you know, just his willingness to send the military down to the South and, and force that issue and make sure that African Americans got the rights that they had just been guaranteed. And um, now, obviously, there's going to be a lot of pitfalls along the way because of uh, just that, that struggle in the nation at that point, you know, that butting of heads during Reconstruction. And so the major success of Grant's presidency really re, uh, lies in the civil rights. Now, the negative side of Grant's presidency, those two terms, was all of the scandals. Um, Grant, unfortunately, you, you know, he, as Ron Chino definitely shows, he probably, in my opinion, could have went into more detail um, on this, but he shows that there are several scandals throughout his presidency. You can't get around it. You can't talk about Grant and his presidency without talking about the scandals. Um, basically, that uh, remember when I said those themes with his character, the the loyalty. Um, yeah, this is going to come back to bite him, where he is loyal to some people he shouldn't have been loyal to. Um, he let people take advantage of him, and Chernow shows that Grant had nothing to do personally with any of the scandals that were going on. He was very naive, very, very naive. Um, and, you know, sometimes that does happen. And, and I'm not trying to justify that in any way. He trusted the wrong people. I think probably Grant's biggest issue um, is not that he, he trusted them at the beginning, because, you know, that, that happens. But it's how Grant continued to back them up after he found out that I mean, he really did find out they were guilty, and he was still trying to be nice to them, still trying to, um, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt. <coughs> Excuse me. And that goes to that loyalty side of Grant, where he was he was loyal to a fault, at you know, to some extent. And and um, I thought Ron Chernow probably could have hammered him a little bit more on that one, because that was definitely a fault of his. Um, so... Grant does try to run for a third presidency, and I thought Trudeau did a great job of taking us through that because I didn't realize how serious um, his run at a third presidency was. I didn't realize that, uh, and I just that's just because of my I haven't studied this part, you know, that post Civil War side from 1865 to uh, the 1900 time period. That's one of my my um, blind areas in American history because my classes don't hit it at school. So I just haven't studied it nearly as much. And I did not realize how close he came to, uh, you know, actually getting a third presidency. I did not realize that. And so Grant does a great job of talking about that whole situation and walking us through, uh, you know, all of those steps towards a third presidency. Um, 
And then that, you know, kind of takes us into, or that is in part four. And at the end of part four, uh, I thought uh, Trineau did a great job of capping Grant's life with um, the last couple chapters talking about him finishing up his memoirs. So Grant got involved in one of the scandals and um, he gets all his money, all the money that he had earned as an adult for when he retired and, you know, the money, if he dies, Julie is going to live, his wife, Julie is going to live on that money. Well, he gets cancer and they're at that situation in life where she's going to live on all of his, you know, all the money he's made and it's all gone. He is flat broke. He can't afford the housekeepers he has. He can't afford mo uh, money. He doesn't have enough money to get food in the house. I mean, he is dead broke. They're relying on everybody's charity. Which, you know, for a man of this stature who, you know, won the Civil War, fought in the Mexican War, he was president of the United States for two terms, and now he can't provide for his family. You talk about the ultimate demasculization of a man. Um, so he's got to find a way to earn some money to take care of Julia when he's gone because he's going to end up uh, that nasty cigar smoking habit that he picked up gives him throat cancer and uh, not good. And so um, he starts writing his memoirs. And at the end of this book, Ron Chino does a great job of memorializing Grant in the writing of his, um, his memoirs. And so great way to cap off the book and everybody realized how great a set of papers, how, you know, it's a two volume set of books that were, that were sold to people around the United States and it became a bestseller. I have them upstairs. I think they are from the, the original publishing date. And uh, after reading this, Ron Cherneau has got me to where I think I'm gonna try to read those this next year, I think. If not next year, the in the next two years, I'm going to try to read the memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant. I thought he did a wonderful job capping off this book and showing the importance of Grant and how Grant, uh, we, now, we now need to take another look at Grant and show his greatness. Uh, despite his faults with all of the scandals, despite that, he had a greatness to him. And he's the guy that... Uh, you know, aside with, with Lincoln, who kept the United States together, kept it whole, and, you know, kept the nation going. Because it easily could have fell apart during Reconstruction. It could have fell apart all over again. Grant prevented that from happening. So anyway, folks, I've talked for long enough. You wanted my thoughts on Grant. I hope that's enough thoughts for you. Uh, I know Brian and I had quite a few more, but um, one thing that you definitely get out of this <coughs> is that, excuse me, is that uh, Ron Chernow was a fan of Ulysses S. Grant. And um, he definitely, it definitely shows in this book where that's probably why I ranked it as a four and a half out of five. Uh, sometimes he almost favors Grant too much. But at the same time, even though I knock it down half a star because of that, at the same time, it's also what makes it extremely readable. It makes you, as the reader, love Grant, and you follow along for the ride. And so it is my suggestion, BookTube, that you go check out Ron Chernow's biography, Grant, and go along for the ride. And um, I don't know, you may have a new favorite biography. So I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for watching, BookTube. And until next time, happy reading.